Every change in our way of life causes us to review our religious orientation. And as we proceed through the centuries, from one generation to another, we find the necessity for continuous reinterpretation of our basic religious convictions. This means that in our Western life today, we need to give a great deal of thought to the search for a basic religious pattern. Nearly 1400 years ago, the Prophet Muhammad sought desperately for a key for the natural religion of mankind. He believed that there must be a faith simple enough to direct and guide the most humble person and yet substantial enough so that the most advanced intellectual could not find it inconsistent with progress or growth in any of our fields of living. That there could be a faith that could remain comparatively unchanging through the ages, which could become the basis for the ever unfolding policies of man's individual and collective existence, that such a faith could exist and did exist, has long been held as reasonable and proper. The enemy of such a faith, the principal adversary to it, is religious complication in whatever department we may find such complication. The so-called dead religions of antiquity did not die because of their religious contribution, but because of their exceedingly crystallized creedal structures, which men gradually left behind. For example, let us take the Greek religion. The type of religious instinct which has given the world Pythagoras and Plato has not essentially changed since their time. But Greek religion of the ancient world has vanished away because of the tremendous incrustation of allegories, myths, legends, and fables, which are no longer acceptable to average modern persons. That it is possible to interpret these myths and legends in a manner to meet the need of other peoples, to realize that certainly Plato did not believe in the gods of Olympus as we find them in the age of fables. The, this we know, but we also realize that the average person is not going to study so profoundly or to search so meaningfully uh, for his spiritual consolation as to attempt to continuously revise such beliefs. The essence of Greek religion is the essence of modern religion. It has come down to us in those great maxims which stem from the golden rule. The same is true of the religion of ancient Egypt that this ancient religion taught men to be honest, sincere, devout, honorable in their relations with others, these elements are undying. They will never change. And in these respects, the faith was essentially real. But it was encrusted with an elaborate pantheon of deities. And these men gradually came to accept and reject. And by degrees, the crystallization of this faith around certain 
theological concepts led to its undoing and its final disappearance. The principles live on, but man must pass periodically through most confusing periods of religious adjustment. And these confusions lead to the breaking up of faiths, the creation of heterodoxies, religious persecution, and the loss of the recognition of the fundamental unity of man's spiritual requirements. Thus today, as before, we are searching for a kind of faith that cannot be shaken, cannot be essentially changed, and yet which is flexible enough and to enable us to grow without coming into conflict with our religious code. Man cannot live with a religion which resists his own natural impulse to unfold the potentials of his own nature. Growth overcomes static in every department of our living, and a religion which does not grow with the people is left behind in the motions of peoples. Yet there is no reason why this must occur. There is no reason why religion should stand in many parts of the world for a totally reactionary point of view. What we need is a faith that moves with us. And in order to have such a religion, we must have an exceedingly simple statement of spiritual values. These values will not change, but creedal developments based upon them will come in conflict with progress. So we search for the beginnings, the roots, of such an adequate spiritual value. And in our progressive fields of advanced religious thinking, we are especially burdened with these problems because many persons are drawn to progressive movements because of the reactionary state of previous movements finding themselves no longer able to accept something which appears not to satisfy the spiritual need of the individual. He is inclined to go out and look for a more satisfactory kind of believing. Thus a great many beliefs are merely reaction beliefs to previous situations. They are reformed efforts to purify, regenerate, or recondition an older doctrine. This constant process of reforming, however, is dated. It forces the individual again to accept a new pattern of restrictions, and in the course of time the reformed movement becomes as reactionary as the older one. There is this continual tendency to crystallization, for things to be degenerated into formal structures and there to die. Consequently, the search for a living religion that we can all work with, a natural faith, must depend upon the establishment of universal authority over human authority. It must mean that this faith takes into consideration all things demonstrable in nature, that it cannot alienate or deny various forms of advancement or knowledge which may not appear to conform with its ancient and rigid position. Thus today our faith seeking must be great enough, strong enough, and courageous enough to cope with the results of scientific progress in the last 250 years. We know that this progress, to the degree that it is progress, 
cannot be contrary to universal procedure. That every discovery that we make of a universal law or of the application of such a law to some reasonable and proper end is essentially a spiritual discovery, whether we know it or not. We have to recognize that science is exploring the anatomy and physiology of the body of God. That which can be shown to be so, can be proven and demonstrated, must either be adjusted with religion or else we shall have conflict. Religion has placed itself in a vulnerable position by assuming certain things to be so and building creeds upon these assumptions. As these assumptions themselves crumble under the pressure of progress, the entire structure of belief is thereby threatened. I think it is much more valuable for us, uh, perhaps, to consider some of the attitudes of the early Buddhistic cults in connection with this. Buddhism was very fortunate in applying its spiritual problem and its spiritual solution directly to the individual and his own adjustment with life. By escaping the construction of a massive creed of its own, Buddhism was able to continue to throw the responsibility of conduct back to the person, with the result that essentially uh, the principles involved are principles to achieve adjustment between the individual and any kind of a world in which he may live. There is no reason to assume from the study of the older scriptures of this sect that any discovery concerning atomics, uh, concerning construction, or the nature of space, or the universe around man, could have any essential effect upon the doctrine. The reason being that it does not become involved in any pattern or formula which can be affected by the passing of circumstances. The formula rests upon the simple problem of man's recognition of value. And this recognition of value in a world of things known or unknown does not essentially change. This gave this particular belief a tremendous power of spiritual insight and has caused many persons of confusion in other beliefs and opinions to turn toward it for consolation and guidance. The essential problem of religion, then, is man's personal relationship to both the known and the unknown. Man's relationship with the known calls upon a strong moral and ethical structure. Man's relationship with the unknown calls upon a great liberality of thinking a deep insight, and the power of the person not to become captured or bound within the area of his own knowing or his own discovering. Thus we come to the private life of the citizen and the situations that he confronts. We know definitely that man, as a psychological being, is in a state of continuous motion if he is healthy. The moment this movement ceases or becomes too strongly disfigured or distorted, the sense of health is lost. On the level of his own nature, man is naturally an inquiring person, seeking the full solution to every problem that confronts him in his own existence. So long as he is an eager seeker, so long as he is continuously striving after that which is better and retains this power 
to break through the patterns of acceptances in order that he may gain greater insight. While he possesses this natural instinct and inclination, he will do reasonably well. But the moment he crystallizes his mind around a set pattern, the moment he says, this I believe and nothing else will I believe, the moment he locks himself in the statement of his present attainment, in that moment he destroys his adjustment with a moving universe around him. He becomes reactionary. He tries to stand still in a world of infinite movement. And as he attempts to stand still, he finds the full weight of this movement battering him. Instead of flowing with it, he tries to stand against it and finds that its motions are inevitable. But in this effort to withstand the movement of inevitables, many forms of sorrow, misery, and disaster come to the individual. If this is true of his general adjustment, it is especially true of his spiritual relationship with life. There is a kind of attitude, an attitude that is difficult to cultivate, an attitude of immediateness, which can be of the greatest value for those searching adjustment with life. It is not a case of rejecting the old. It is not a case of attempting to live in a fixation of rebellion against things as they are. It is not a case of the individual feeling that progress is merely motion. It has to be directed motion. And it is not certainly a case of the individual improving himself by changing his affiliations while his own nature remains unchanged. All of these escape mechanisms are essentially worthless. They bring no true progress with them. The individual must have this sense of immediateness and yet a wonderful ability to move, to keep constantly attuned to the unfolding pageantry of life values. Society as a structure rumbles like the ancient car of Juggernaut. It moves very slowly. Masses always move slowly. And there is ever a conflict between the motion of masses and the adjustment of the individual. A great many persons in every culture and civilization are in advance of the mass movements around them. These persons are frequently persecuted because they have broken the mass patterns. But there is certainly always going to be a sense of futility or of frustration within the life of the growing person who must slow his tempo of motion to keep adjustment with the slow moving ponderous mechanism of masses. Now, if he becomes irritated by this difference, by this slow movement around him, and feels that it is restricting his own individual growth, then the irritation which he creates will be a further detriment to him. Everything in nature, particularly in natural religion, is therefore based upon the ability of the individual to face facts without flinching, to face the thing as it is with a good hope, with a proper spiritual understanding of value. Very often, the most miserable circumstances that arise within our own natures come from our own impatience, from our own inability to gain insight into the proper and orderly movements of the universe to which we belong. Therefore, if we are to understand these problems, we must have certain integration, certain patience and tolerance, and 
depend ever more upon our own internal sources of value to keep us oriented in relationship to environment pressures around us. Thus, all natural religion, seemingly, has to arise within man himself and has to arise through his own progress, his own growth, and through the unfoldment of his own insight into patterns of value. The nearest thing we can ever know to truth in the middle stream of our seeking is factuality, things that are of themselves true, as far as we can discern truth, must have certain value. Our ability to accept value, to accept truth, to accept the examples of realism or truthfulness around us. This ability is of the greatest help in our adjustment. There is no use of any individual turning in rebellion against his world because his world is in substance the expression of the growth of the divine power in all things. We may wish things were better we may conceive that they could be better. We may labor industriously to make them better in every way that we know. But the moment our efforts or our attitudes result in criticism in ourselves, result in antagonisms towards other people, and cause us to begin this negative criticism in which everyone is stupid but ourselves, the moment this attitude arises, our value as persons is lost, and our value to ourselves as sources of personal integration, this also is lost. For every individual who feels that he lives in a stupid world has locked himself against the universal picture or concept which he should be seeking by a more positive and constructive attitude. The search for our natural faith, then, must assume to a certain degree that we are satisfied to be natural, that we desire it, and that we want to build our religious conviction upon a recognition of values, values unchanging, because we sustain them upon the level of principles and do not be, allow them to become the subject of debate and controversy among other persons. I would like to assume then for the moment that in our search for this more natural and adequate uh, conviction, our search must always be for that which reveals to the fullest conceivable degree the, the nature of deity through the workings of deity in the everyday and commonplace experiences we know. As Lord Bacon said, it is not necessary to, for deity to work miracles for the reason that his common works are themselves sufficiently miraculous. The miraculous spiritual testimony of the common works of God and life. This testimony is enough if we begin to understand it. Our natural religion arises from our natural reaction to the, the universal movement, the universal life within us and about us, constantly fulfilling its own purposes. Thus we can keep our faith a comparatively simple structure. And this does not prevent us uh, from recognizing the importance of the advancement of every degree of learning for which we have aptitude. We must realize, however, that the advancement of a philosophical system involves a certain amount of conflict. Ideas must be in conflict. 
especially those in which certain abstractions make universal concord exceedingly difficult. Thus, when we approach things mentally, we divide them, we analyze them, we weigh them, and we come to conclusions correct or erroneous, and we must be willing to constantly amend our own thinking, as this thinking uh, must inevitably continually advance and must constantly cause us to outgrow previous concepts. On the level of science, the same thing is true. Science is a constant movement toward the accumulation of facts about the nature and function of universal energies, substances, and materials. Thus science, having profoundly and proudly announced a discovery, must five or ten years later humbly retract its own statement and give a new explanation more in line with the enlarging discoveries which we make. Of our physical and social life, the same thing may be said to be true. Changes in inventions in our arts and sciences cause almost total reformations or changes in our ways of living. The discovery of the automobile, of television, of radio, motion picture, the aeroplane, all of these discoveries have changed the motions and directions of civilization, creating worlds unknown to our ancestors and problems which our forebears never faced. All these changes require that the individual keep himself in a competitively flexible state to prevent unnecessary shock. If he becomes too fixed or too addicted to any pattern, he will suffer for that addiction. And while he thinks it is martyrdom, it is usually a comparatively wasteful kind of suffering. Because man going down in valiant defense of that which cannot be defended has not accomplished a great deal. It is far more important to recognize that in every field of life that we know, things are changing. In every field of our environment, things are changing. Our cities are changing because of the great networks of freeways and public utilities that come into existence. And as these cities grow, the need for greater civic facilities, the need for greater utility in function, such needs constantly change the faces of cities, causing them to differ in their appearances day by day. And here in our own community, we can actually see these differences week after week neighborhoods and areas are in constant change. Cities are springing up where not long ago there were only open places. Thus the need arising from action. Each situation that arises becomes a challenge which either must be met or the motion of growth must cease. We accept this physically. We accept also the constantly shifting social patterns of our relationships with other people. The social integration of a hundred years ago is gone. It will not come back. The social integration of today perhaps is distinguished mostly by lack of integration. But this must also move forward into some finally solutional pattern. But by the time the solution is found, man will again be moving into a new situation, causing adjustment to be the eternal problem that faces every generation that comes into this world. On the levels of science, we are able to keep a more open mind because the very attitude of science is a constant challenging of the unknown. Occasionally, science pauses and becomes stupid. It decides that it knows. But in a very short time, this stupidity is checked or corrected by some valiant individual, and the great search goes on. Science almost refuses to permit even a peaceful moment 
in the constant challenge of knowledge. This challenge may be excessive. A great many so-called forms of progress are not progressive, but still the struggle goes on, and the purely scientific mind is defended and protected by one simple factor, one credo, which becomes terribly important, and that is that he simply lives to solve the unknown. He never assumes for a moment that it has been solved. He never permits himself the luxury of believing that the textbooks he learned, he learned his lessons from will even be the same books his children will study. He is moving and has this sense of motion, and this sense of motion protects him and prevents scientific groups from being at open warfare with each other. There is certain criticism, but today this criticism is subjected almost immediately to laboratory testing. And there are very few cases in which uh, some common agreement will not result from the factual experimental processes. Certain things become known, others still remain elusive, and the quest goes on. But the scientist is not of a mind to say this I do not dare to think because Aristotle thought differently. That attitude is more or less gone and consequently with it departed a great many stress patterns which burden medieval mankind. Philosophy is not so fortunate today. In the first place, philosophy is not, at this time, a very dynamic part of our living. The average person is not trusting it sufficiently to make it universally important. The philosopher, for the most part today, is an intellectualist working merely with the conflict of mental ideas, seldom if ever attempting to apply them to any practical or relevant uh, program. The active parts of philosophy have been usurped by science, and wherever philosophy had a technique, as in the case of psychology, this te technique has been absorbed by science with very little credit to its source. There is no particular instinct today among persons in general to recognize the importance of philosophical orientation. The attitude has been that all this type of thinking is more or less sterile. And that has been due to the fact that since the decline of the great classical systems of learning, there has been very little basic philosophical insight. A few schools, yes, but for the most part these were highly academic and did not touch the life of the average person. And when in ancient times philosophy was divided from religion, its, in, its existence as a powerful instrument of human progress uh, was threatened and finally largely undermined. So we have today a kind of philosophy that is still school-bound, that is still held too tightly in the pattern of things. And to a measure, this type of philosophy, because of the type of mind involved, has drifted into our educational structure. Our educational structure being a kind of of abridged and diluted philosophical theory. Education, because of its inclination to be theoretical, is still failing to meet the dynamic of our present problem and is causing more and more concern on every level of social consciousness. This leaves us then with our religious equation. And our religious equation has remained perhaps more adamant and more reactionary than almost any other group that we have. Now the line of demarcation here has been difficult to distinguish. Religion is firmly convinced that it is dealing with eternal value. And uh, to a measure this is correct. The religious need of man 
will not change, at least for a very, very long time. The essential moral and ethical codes of religion are as useful today as they ever were. And one of our difficulties has been the tendency to drift away from them. On the other hand, these codes are supported in many instances by something that is fading from our perspective, and that is extreme authoritarianism. Today, modern man is not inclined to be over-impressed by authority. He is less and less of a mind to believe things because other people say them. And up to the present time in our Western modern stream of religious th thinking, nearly all forms of religious instruction have been preaching or preachments or teachments from the outside. The individual has been initiated into his cultus. He has been taught that certain principles are true because certain venerated persons have stated them. Man is less and less inclined to accept this, especially as the surviving statements of so many of these religious founders are not found to be in complete conformity with what is now factually known. This difference has had a tendency to undermine the strength of authority. Thus, a static religion or one arising in historical perspective only. As Albert Schweitzer very clearly points out, that the spiritual consolational value of history is diminishing rapidly. The importance of historical descent, authority or dignity based upon age alone, is losing interest. Authority based upon the opinions of persons long dead is also losing validity. Therefore, complete structures in which there is no obvious or evident adjustment in a hundred years, five hundred years, or a thousand years, such reactionary groups are now viewed with suspicion. Yet these groups are themselves placed in a difficult situation. Namely, to what degree can they permit themselves to change without attacking or assailing the fundamental infallibility which is part of their basic claim and part of their assumed uh, reason for existence. Infallibility upon these levels is becoming less and less interesting to the average thoughtful person of today. He is not concerned so much with the tremendous structure of church legislation, law, and, and uh, orthodoxy as he is with the need for a dynamic individual living message. Actually, from the beginning and always, Authority is in conflict with individual insight. The individual has within himself an essential and immediate part of the divine nature available to him through the cultivation of his own spiritual resources. Practically all religions as we know them today are actually instruments of discipline. They are primarily moral and ethical structures created to invite the individual to live nobly, worthily, and honorably. The purpose of so living is that the individual may gain certain internal discipline leading to the maturity of his own consciousness. It is the natural and reasonable expectation that if man can achieve a certain state of integration within himself, he will be capable of the direct experience of that spiritual power which must lead him and inspire him to the advancement of his life. Thus the whole tendency is, from today, is today from authority in religion 
to the production of, of individual religious insight. The person must be led by his own spiritual content. And this spiritual content is peculiarly suitable to him because it must represent to a large degree the total integration of his own personality. It must present him with that which is essentially necessary, and that is the next step in his own spiritual unfoldment. He builds upon the solid foundation of that which he has already attained, and may therefore proceed reasonably to that which next in invites attainment. And by so doing, he proceeds without unnecessary involvement in theory, or without being forced to make unpleasant decisions about matters concerning which he is uninformed. Thus, the motion of our religious life is more and more toward the discovery of religious content in our own living. To discover this religious content is of an important experience inasmuch as it does not essentially have very much to do with theological content. Obviously, from the beginning, man has clothed his religious instinct in theological vestments. His religions are the symbolic extensions of his spiritual convic convictions and experiences. But it is not essential that this clothing must go on. Man is gradually reaching a degree of unfoldment in which he may receive the impact of spiritual experience without involving it immediately in some extraordinary theological pattern. Thus also the tendency of the individual to create a religion by his own experience, to create innumerable sects and creeds, perhaps many of them of slight value and slight endurance. This tendency also diminishes as understanding gives us insight into the correct and reasonable method of discovering spiritual value. The most primitive of all such discovery is the total impact of the universe upon the total psyche of the human being. This is constantly occurring, and it also occurred in the very beginning of our experience. The difference between the impact then and now is simply the interpretive power of man which has continually increased so that his reaction to this impact is constantly changing. The impact remains the same, but man's ability to use this impact changes with his own personal attainments so that he reacts differently today from the way in which he reacted 5,000 or 10,000 years ago. But what he is reacting to has not essentially changed. Now this presents us with a twofold problem which East and West have attempted to solve in their own ways. Western man, recognizing the, in, the eternal impact of the universe upon man, has also assumed the eternal need for an evolutionary procedure by means of which man is forever interpreting this impact with improved and increasing faculties. Thus the strengthening of the total faculty structure of man, the refinement of his sensory perceptions, and finally the training and coordination of his rational faculties. These procedures, it is assumed, will ultimately enable man to interpret correctly all of the impact which he receives. The time at which this might be likely is undetermined, but it is assumed that because man is increasing rapidly and the momentum of his faculty growth is gaining speed constantly, that this attainment may not be as distant or remote as was originally assumed. That in the course of ages, no one knows how long, maybe a million years, maybe a hundred million years, 
man it is assumed will finally reach the condition in which it will be possible for him to interpret completely with his own unfolded faculties the total impact of universal fact and by so doing to exchange all doubts and insecurities for security and strength of understanding so that man can then obey perfectly because he understands perfectly. However, mo motive has become an important factor in Western thinking and perhaps is one of the sovereign weaknesses in our structure. Man certainly is unfolding and growing and he is increasing in knowledge. But why? The motivation behind this progress is of the deepest importance. And in our Western way of life, our motives seem to become less and less clear. They are more and more obscured by ulterior designs and purposes. Thus, it is scarcely possible to say today that man's active motive for the search for knowledge is universal betterment. Theoretically, it is. Practically, it is not. Practically, it is not because man has not yet the universal comprehension with which to comprehend the meaning of universal betterment. Actually, he is proceeding day by day in the advancement of knowledge for a hundred secondary causes. A great deal of laboratory research work today, for example, is purely competitive. It is merely to devise a product which can take more advertising than that of the competitor. Therefore, in uh, many instances, or as you know in television and radio, we are told about the new secret scientific formulas in toothpaste, mouthwash, uh, dish soap, and everything you can think of. Science is competing largely to produce products uh, which will compete with other products. These, in turn, must continue their competition to survive. And so, almost against our natural inclinations or instincts, we are forced to advance knowledge simply in order to stay in business. This is not the real motive behind advancement. Nor is the real motive behind advancement military protection. This might seem at the moment to be a major factor. And it may also be that progress that can be used in times of peace will be hastened by the dangers of war. But at the same time, the clear motive of why we want to know is not what it should be. And people who come to me constantly seeking for help are very often seeking for the most ulterior reasons. They come not because they wish to be better people, but because they wish to find some way of outwitting others. This attitude is too prevalent and does represent a dilution of motive. And this dilution of motive shows the failure of religion and philosophy in the life of the individual who is making physical advancements without adequate ethical and moral perspectives. Where such advancement goes on the physical levels only, uh, beyond a certain degree of excess, we must expect uh, unfortunate complications as the inevitable result. Thus we have a certain progress forced upon us constantly. This progress becoming ever more difficult for us to bear as individuals. We are uh, reaching a point very definitely at this time in which our factual knowledge is so far ahead of our digestive and assimilative powers that we are under the danger of serious dyspepsia. We are discovering so many things that we are not fitting into anything. We pick up the newspaper or our favorite publication and find out things that are happening that are new and important. But we cannot figure how these things affect us. 
we can only react to them with hope or fear, a kind of a blanket attitude. We are unable to cope with their implications in the terms of this motion that is going on around us continuously. If then we are not able to make any kind of practical adjustment, these changes slowly accumulate until they suddenly strike the total pattern of our living and fragment it, break it up, and leave us discouraged, disillusioned, confused, because familiar things have simply dropped away from under our feet. There are a great many persons under that kind of pressure at the present time. The universe, however, keeps on moving, keeps on reminding us that in some wonderful way our peace, our security, our integrity must be found in motion or in movement itself and not in a set, unchangeable attitude toward things. The only way in which we can really be happy at the moment, securely happy, really happy, is to be able to be truly happy in the process of growing. That it is growth itself that must provide us with happiness. It is not the end that we seek that will console us, because the end is not obvious, nor can we rationalize our own state in any terminal condition. It is therefore only the ability of man to spiritually adjust to motion, to learn to move without regret and without fear, to adjust his entire spiritual code to an ever-changing world around him, but in terms of never-changing principles within him. Between these eternal principles and human applications interpose his own emotional mental life. Man, in trying to understand, must in various ways interpret, but he must have with these interpretations a kind of reserve, a reservation, realizing that every interpretation that he makes must be subject to further interpretation. He also must solve the problem of his own relationship to this ever-moving environment, a relationship which must be healthy, must be normal, and must be reasonable. Searching for the clue to such relationship, man finds the pure spiritual fact, the most solutional of all possible answers. Yet to make use of this pure spiritual fact, the individual must be able to disassociate it from the patterns around him and create new association relationships himself. In other words, he must be able to recognize the importance of this purely spiritual reality in himself as something which makes it possible for him to live in a changing world and in a growing concept of God. Unless he is able to do this, he is in trouble. No one wishes to assume that God has changed as often or as completely as in the descent of religious symbolism. The divine power is in its own nature eternal and is the eternal cause of non-eternal circumstances. The nature of God in substance is immense and unknowable. The nature of God in matter and in material expression and extension is infinite motion and infinite change. Man, therefore, must have his relationship to that which is forever the same in the root of himself and also bridge the interval so that he can live in a world in which things are never the same but are by their very nature forever and continually unfolding. If he can take the attitude, for example, that the reason why the never-changing manifests as the ever-changing 
is because the never changing has absolute and complete potential. Therefore, the ever changing is the ever manifesting of that for which there is no limit to manifestation. Therefore, that inconceivable diversity still flows out of unity. And yet this diversity is only diverse because of our inability to reconcile it with its own nature, substance, and unity. Thus man must always be the reconciler between the thing within him and the things around him. And it is to build the kind of life that makes this reconciliation reasonable, practical, and proper. This is the challenge of adjustment, the type of thing that we must work with every day of our lives. If we can assume, for example, or can come to experience through our own lives the infinite potential of deity, if we can go as far even as the ancient Chaldeans, who declared that deity was an ever-flowing fountain from which all things have their origin and move inevitably and continuously into expression. We realize that part of the omnipotence of deity is revealed through the infinite diversity of the divine way of things. Also, that in this diversity, with all its innumerable branches and interrelationships, there is in the universe itself amazingly little conflict. Although the infinite ways of life are infinite and ultimately and eternally diversified, the principal cause of conflict in any order of life that we are able to discover is the rising of intellectual isolationism. If, for example, this world had continued only without mental interference by the part of man, it is very probable that it would have gone on until it produced some other creature capable of producing intellectual interference. And if man should be wiped away, other creatures would gradually take his place, rising also to the state of intellectual interference. Thus, that there should be an interference on the part of mind seems to be inevitable. But wherever it arises, it creates the principal discord that is possible for us to recognize or know in connection with world life. We know that this discord in the case of man has led to the destruction of most values which he holds sacred. We also know that in some mysterious way nature is punishing this interference, this misinterpretation, and is placing man under the heavy penalties of war, crime, suffering, poverty, and death. We know that in some mysterious way, therefore, we are supposed to learn something. And the thing that we are supposed to learn is the danger of using partial knowledge to interfere with the motion of a universal plan. The answer, however, is what other kind of knowledge have we? How can we use absolute knowledge when we do not possess it? How then are we going to advance without interference? How are we going to live and grow without battling with each other? over our attitudes and over our opinions. Nature placed in the instinct life of man the solution to this, but man has lost sight of it. It placed it in him a certain religious overtone, a spiritual sense of value, which was assumed to be capable of rescuing man from the dilemma of his own intellectualism. And in part at least, down through the ages, religion has so succeeded, but not as admirably or completely as we might desire. As I said before, I believe that one of the reasons for this has been the intellectual tendency to divide religion, so that we did not receive the primary example of religion, the one thing that religion might have conferred that might have prevented most of our trouble.
and that was the complete union of spiritual consciousness. This, uh, the union of spiritual value. If the religions of the world could show, could reveal that they have risen above all intolerances and all intemperances and have come to one solid core of spiritual integrity, it probably would result in the outlawing of war. It, it could be very conceivable that a total unity of man on the level of his own aspiration would change the entire structure of civilization, economic, industrial, scientific, political, and philosophical. That this strong affirmation of value would end forever one of the principal dissonances from which we suffer, that is religious confusion. <clears throat> now we are beginning to realize this. A great many leaders in religious movements are beginning to realize this. Some have known it for a very long time. But generally speaking, the great movement of masses has not yet sustained this realization. And there are many competitive elements involving economic factors that must yet be solved before a true union of religious convictions might appear to be possible. So we stand around and wait hoping for a better religious unity, much as we hope that in a few days we're going to elect a better Senate or a better Congress or better representatives. Uh, there is some question as to the probability that our hopes will be fulfilled. And there is also some question as to whether we are going to fulfill our spiritual hopes about legislated religious unity. It is extremely doubtful. The individual, however, fortunately, has been given a degree of insight which he cannot uh, remove from his own consciousness. All religion is leading to a kind of spiritual liberty, even as theoretically all policy and politics uh, are ultimately leading to the state of a working and practical democracy of nations. <clears throat> Thus, the religious situation is moving infinitely and inevitably toward the final statement of itself, and that is man's immediate personal experience of religion. Religion remains theoretical and to a large degree philosophical or scientific, until man himself can experience the fact of religion in his own life. All religious training is toward this. But in our more recent time, we have not been tempted to consider this equation as seriously as we should. The pressures of conformities are still strong, and the reactionary tendencies are still oppressive. And the simple fact that man, through an attainment of inner serenity or tranquility, can actually receive his own spiritual nutrition from within his own nature. And this directly according to his need. This realization must ultimately result in the formation of a religion that is much nearer to nature. All that formalized religion can do for the individual is to give him certain moral religious instruction. Religion is a kind of school as we know it today. But true religion in the voice of nature is not simply a school. It is an experience. It is something which impacts the individual with a direct ray of universal consciousness. And once this consciousness moves the person, that person, sustained by this experience within himself, is stronger than all of the pressures of environment. One human soul always overbalances the world. But man does not know how to realize this in his own experience. The individual who has this certain internal 
strengthening of spiritual value is stronger than the collective body of humanity. Not because he is going to war with that body of humanity, but because his own positive state is more enduring and more vital than the negative collectivity around him. Man is therefore part of negation only when he himself is negative. And the moment he attains a positive polarity in his religious life, he is stronger than the doubts, fears, pressures, and circumstances which now so gravely trouble him. Thus, in the search for a natural religion, we must, of course, create for this a natural human being. Now, a natural human being is what nature intended us all to be. Therefore, the, ten the motion toward naturalness is a motion with life, with purpose, with universal decree, and attaining toward its end the full cooperation of natural procedure. Whereas man trying to isolate himself, to be different, to oppose nature, to overwhelm nature with his own force, such motions are unnatural, receive no support from nature itself, and ultimately lead to disaster. Thus man seeking naturalness is simply unburdening himself of, vas of factors and elements which have been a detriment to him from the beginning and have brought him little, if anything, other than misery and tragedy. Yet we cling desperately to these impedimenta of one kind or another, lacking the courage to let them go. We all seem to lack the courage to be ourselves. We are afraid of the inevitable consequences. Yet these consequences can never be as disastrous as the process of trying to be not ourselves. Here is the real conflict with all things. Nature seeking to produce and determined to produce a natural creature is therefore seeking only one end, an obeying creature, a creature through whom the, in, the inevitable movement of the universe may continue to expand. Therefore, nature seeks to make all its creatures and creations fruitful, fruitful in the sense of bearing witness, are becoming channels for the continuing unfoldment of the divine energy. Thus every planet that is fashioned, every type of growth that we observe in nature, every plant and animal, all these manifestations are not the ends of things, but are transitional states. Through these various forms, other forms are being validated, are being made real, and the extension of energy is continuing. In the case of man, the extension of the divine energy through the emotional, mental, and spiritual activity of the human being is perhaps greater than that of the extension of physical dominion. Thus God is revealing a phase of its own power through man, not otherwise revealed in nature. And it is man's problem to be a proper agent of this revelation, like the prophets of old, that we may hear the voice of God, that we may know the presence of God, and may be moved to obey the will of God in these essential internals of our existence. It is therefore so important to us to try to achieve a rapport, a an harmonization of our lives with the, uh, with the universal or divine life. And we have tried in every way to see how this could be done. And we divide man's reactions into two kinds. There are two kinds of people. People who are by nature aggressive or objective in their function and people who are by nature subjective or acceptive in their function. Nature in its own infinite wisdom seemingly continues to punish aggression. Nature does not wish man to aggressively seek to conquer space. 
but ma nature is perfectly willing to permit the obedient man to experience the conquest of space. Space awaits man's service, waits for man's growth. Man will ultimately achieve what he calls conquest over it. But nature likes to prefer that man to assume that man will be conquered by the mystery of space and will approach it with a proper reverence and understanding, not assuming that he is going to become master of it, but that rather he is going to be the wise and honorable servant of a new dimension of existence which we may term space existence. That the purpose of all this growth is not that man shall reach another planet, but that man shall become a gardener in a larger garden, that in all things he shall continue to attempt in every way possible to obey and serve the universal principles which are going to be still more manifested to him as his consciousness enlarges. It is then a quite reasonable and possible for us in private living to assume that this natural religion must be eternally available. Mohammed thought that it was, and other mystics have had the same conviction. The ancient prophets of Israel are supposed to have been able to commune in the desert or in a mountain or in a valley and hear the voice of their father. The natural religion of man is not something remote and strange, not something distant and unobtainable. It is something ever-present which man has overlooked or which man has ignored because of the complicating processes of his own intellect. Natural religion, therefore, has always been associated with a simple phenomena which men have used since the dawn of time and that has been prayer. Prayer is simply man's asking, and he asks of that which is everywhere, quite convinced that no matter what part of the earth he may inhabit, his prayer will be equally answered, or will be equally heard by this power which is omnipresent and is capable of hearing everything always. But most of all, in the mystery of prayer, man has simply taken the attitude of asking the divine guidance, asking the divine help, asking for the divine instruction. Man has taken the attitude of his own inadequacy and has sought very sincerely and humbly, in most cases, for divine uh, direction. And the study of prayer phenomena indicates that the more devoutly, the more humbly, the more simply, and the more naturally the individual approaches this mystery, the more likely he is to receive the full benefit thereof. It is therefore a matter of motive, the individual with ulterior motive the individual who is praying for something that is not necessary, not real, that is not in harmony with the divine relationship between God and man, may or may not have his prayer responded to. But if his supplication is in full earnestness, asking light, asking truth, asking direction, as the old American Indian prayer Father, show us the way. And then the perfect consecration that if this way is made known, we will walk it without reservation, without any equivocation to take care of our material ambitions, but will attempt to form a complete and perfect union between the will of God in ourselves and the conduct of our lives. Where this attitude is real, the results of the spiritual life of man are also real, powerful, and important. But the individual who, having so supplicated, immediately forgets 
the level and problem of his matter. And the emergency past continues on with his old accustomed ways. Such a person may come to doubt religion because he has doubted the value of it in his own life. So the old mystics held very definitely that it was not a magnificent problem in intellectual conquest that became the root of our religious life, but rather a dedication of the individual's level of values, the certain and clear resolution on the part of the individual to obey that which he knows to be true, a perfect willingness to sacrifice everything else for the simple expression of that which is necessarily next in the process of living. Now the person may have this doubt, and many do, is this thing to which we sacrifice, is this really true? Are we moving according to a fact, or are we moving only according to our own opinions? Here we come back to our Eastern philosophy. To be absolutely sure of these values within our own consciousness, we must also be absolutely sure of our own standard of values. We must be able to feel and know that we are not addicted to such ulterior motives of emotion and thought as might easily cause us to corrupt divine instruction. The individual who is essentially selfish, who has made no correction in his own life, will certainly not be able to trust the interpretations which he places upon spiritual revelation. On the other hand, he can attend church forever, and while he remains selfish, the church will do him no good. As long as he remains dishonest in his own inner life, religion in its substance cannot reach him. The only uh, way religion can serve him is to reprimand him by presenting him with problems which his own attitudes cause him uh, to react to unfavorably and thus increase his own complications. Thus our spiritual problem resolves itself into a rather simple matter which has not so much to do with help from the outside or instruction received from others. Rather, it is available to the man on the desert island who has no contact with others. It is available to the individual of limited or moderate attainments, and it is just as necessary to the person with the highest achievements because it is a process of working through our own motivations, working honestly and sincerely with ourselves as we are and as we know ourselves to be. It is inconceivable that most persons do not actually have a fair knowledge of their own uh, mistakes. People do not like to admit this, but the selfish person does know he is selfish. And somewhere along the line, others have also told him so. He prefers to be selfish in the full knowledge that he is selfish, and he expects to get away with it. He is therefore righteously indignant if he does not. The person who is a confirmed worrier perfectly well knows it. Nobody can worry from morning till night for 20 years without knowing they're doing it. Their answer is they can't help it. Anyone would worry in a spot like theirs. <laughs> but actually, nobody has been in a spot that long. These persons are simply chronic worriers. The individual who uh, is unable to control a bad temper is perfectly aware of it. They also have paid heavy penalties for losing that temper at the wrong time. But instead of recognizing this value, they have become more irritable, 
and more eager to blame other people. They do not have bad tempers. They suffer from righteous indignation. But a condition of perpetual righteous indignation also recommends a general review of the case. An individual who is temperamentally fearful is perfectly aware of this, just as surely as the one who has claustrophobia is aware of it. We know these faults. We know that we make the same mistakes repeatedly. We do not wish to talk about it. We hate to be reminded of it. And we are seriously unhappy if people spread stories about it. But still, we know that it is so. So in the faith uh, of the mystic, we move from things that we know. There's no need to gain long encyclopedic explanations of these things. We do not need a Plato or an Aristotle to philosophize them for us. The individual knows when he's right and he knows when he's wrong within the area of his own experience and function. He also knows that he is going to continue to be unhappy and badly adjusted while he continues to be wrong. So he is anxious to find some remedy for this wrongness. The beginning of this remedy is the recognition that all energy moving through him from divine or universal sources must be contaminated and colored tinctured, diluted, and polluted by his own nature. And that as long as he uses energy to advance the wrong purposes or to defend wrong conduct of his own or in desperation to force wrong to be apparently right, as long as he does this, the availability of divine and natural religion is not his. If, however, this individual really desires to escape from the uncertainties and inconsistencies of opinion in knowledge and of the varying levels of interpretation, which are an eternal aggravation to the spirit, if we really wishes to escape these things, or to find a better way of life, then he must enter into a very simple relationship with life itself, a relationship which is quite within the comprehension of the child, but appears to be absolutely incomprehensible to the world-worn adult, where it is most necessary that comprehension should exist. It is the same principle and all great mystical teachers and great religious leaders have recognized it. This problem of our religious life beginning primarily with ourselves, with the simple process of putting our own lives into a relationship with life, by means of which we have earned the right to know the reason for our own existence. And if we will attempt to so adjust ourselves, we shall discover that the slightest improvement wrought as the result of conscious dedication will bring with it immediate help and immediate increase in the well-being of our total pattern of living. The individual who does not break the rules will not suffer as the one must suffer who does break the rules. And everything that is not good breaks the rules. Everything that is not noble, kindly, good, and divine, and according to the highest concept that we have of spiritual integrity, anything less than this concept is less than that which is necessary for our immediate security. Now, each person depending upon his own inner life for guidance, will also be practically guided. He will not be expected to do things impossible to him, nor will he have frustrations and inhibitions thrust upon him by creedal sectarianism, 
forcing him to live patterns which he does not particularly appreciate or understand. This motion coming from within himself always reveals what is next, and seldom more than that. It shows him how to cope with the immediate, and through the solution of the immediate to move on in growth without pressure or danger to his integrity. The individual who solves the next problem in life consistently and continuously never has a problem. Because nearly all problems, if solved, disintegrate or cease to exist. And if they are badly approached, each problem will in turn become the parent of a dozen more. Thus, to the knowledge that we need, is only the knowledge necessary to do the next thing well. To achieve this, we must do it according to the law of its own nature and the law of its own kind. We must keep the law of that thing. We must keep the law of our own relationship with it. And we must do this regardless of expense to ourselves in other things. If we will have the uh, integration necessary to do this, we shall live in an unproblemed universe. Having achieved a certain control or discipline over the problem-making factors of our natures, having come thus gradually to the point where we are free from the imposed faults of our own weaknesses, then we can attain a certain impersonal, relaxed, kindly, receptive attitude toward the universal mystery of truth. The moment the individual is at peace, his heart becomes a divine oracle. The voice of the will of deity is ever available to those who have attained a peaceful adjustment with their own natures, and who have placed simple and natural things above all artificial considerations. The power of divine direction is available the moment the individual recovers from the feeling that he must misdirect himself. If, therefore, we wish true religion, if we wish to be what we must become, the living temple, if we wish to be in our own hearts the ecclesia of a living and eternal faith, then we must build the house according to the law. We must sanctify it. We must not permit that which is profane to enter into it, and we must enter into it ourselves with reverence. If we build this kind of an internal in our own lives, we can receive the direct impression of the divine will for us. We will have our faith. It will be a harmless faith. It will be a natural faith. Because harmfulness is the aggression of ulterior motive. Where this ceases, we will not be burdened by it. But living naturally and happily, we will have the strength of a strong internal religious understanding with which to cope with the confusion of our political, industrial, and social lives. Having achieved this integration in ourselves, we may then move through our world gallantly, constructively, industriously. We do all the works that we have ever been required to do, perhaps better than ever before, but we do it with a sincere conviction of the present place of things in a universal plan, we perceive the reason for things as they are, and we give thanks for the greatness and wisdom of that power, which seeing far beyond our ignorance, has been able to fashion all things according to their total needs, whereas we can see these needs only in part, and as through a glass darkly. So our own faith is strengthened, our correct relation to life is established, 
and we become worshippers of a natural religion, available to all through inner contact with that God which is the God of nature, the God of man, the God of worlds, a deity which has made nature to be fruitful and will help man to be fruitful and has placed within the soul of man a divine life which is itself fruitful and that it is man's privilege and pleasure to bear witness to this fruitfulness, to live according to it, to keep its rules, to serve in its name, and to enjoy the peace and adjustment that comes to those that keep the faith, and in keeping the faith, keep the peace between themselves and all other living things. Time's up. In its early rise, the Christian Church created seven sacraments, instruments of purification largely relating to the relationships between man as a person and his eternal state in nature, that these arose from certain experiences within man's own life we know. Therefore, next Sunday morning we are going to consider the seven sacraments as psychotherapy, and I think we will find it an interesting uh, study. May I call to your attention that our new book, Collected Writings, is now available on the table. We hope you will find it a useful Christmas present for your friends. If you buy it now, as we've pointed out before, you can read it yourself before you give it away. <laughs> this uh, giving us a proper sense of economy in these expensive times. In connection with our Wednesday evening series on Emerson, which has seemingly brought out a considerable amount of interest and has been extremely well attended, I'd like to point out that we have an article on the philosophy of Emerson in our book, Pathways of Philosophy, uh, which is a story of the descent of Neoplatonism from the time of the classic Greeks to Ralph Waldo Emerson. And uh, many uh, modern persons are beginning to see in Emerson another example of this search for natural value. And among these people, this New England transcendentalist group, uh, out of the earth and the sky and the air, they fashioned a beautiful understanding of life which has influenced American letters for over a century. And we think that some of you will be interested again in remembering the contributions made by Emerson and the other members of that group. So we hope you will consider this book, and we hope to see you all with us next week, and we thank you for being here this morning.